Hello everybody, this is your host Noi Levy welcoming you to the second part of this four part series where I'll be ranking all the films I've watched this year. At this point in the video I'll be recommending you to go back and watch the first part as it's there that I really detail what's going on in this series. But in case you missed it, last episode I went back and talked about films 80 to 61 on this year's list. Some highlights included 1952, Summerstock, and others. This episode, I'll be giving you my opinions on better films such as 1954's Sabrina or 1966 The Shooting. Stay tuned as the discussion will begin now. We are starting off strong with Mel Brooks' Star Wars parody Spaceballs. Now if you remember from last episode, I shared with you my fascination with his movies, so it should come as no surprise to you that I did in fact enjoy this. Even though I am not a fan of the original Star Wars trilogy, I still found some humor in Dom DeLuise's Pizza the Hut and the many camera placements around the ship. There was also a moment where they even advertised merchandise for the film prior to its release and even had a showing of Blazing Saddles. Rick Moranis was fantastic as this movie's version of Darth Vader. I found myself laughing at his many remarks. It's safe to say that I enjoyed this movie. In my words, it's the most parody, parody movie. You'll get it when you see it. Now, The Mule is a very adventurous movie. It was directed by Clint Eastwood and recommended to me by my dad, so you know things are going to get wild. In case you missed that last reference, my dad has been recommending me wild and out there movies to watch with him, and that's what we've been doing together. Watch the last episode for more. Anyways, in this movie, Clint Eastwood plays a quiet gardener who finds himself in unknowingly deep shit when he takes a job as a driver to bring in more income. Things get pretty fun and out of control for this gardener when he finds out that this company he's working for is in fact having him deliver certain substances to places. He decides to keep this job and help around as it's really paying the bills and he wants to get his ex-wife back so there's another motive for him. Honestly, this movie was a crazy time. A bit boring at first, but it's all in good fun. Definitely place this on your watch list, so you won't regret it. Yagshamash! Time for our first Borat review of the series. Was that a tease? Maybe. You'll have to see. In my opinion, this subsequent movie film was not far from a success. Unlike the first Borat, the humor was somewhat unseasoned and the daddy-daughter storyline didn't sit with me. It's a Borat film. No time for sentiment. Maria Bakalova was amazing as a daughter. Sasha Baron Cohen crushed it as always. That ball scene was iconic when Bakalova was in that meeting and she announced something totally inappropriate to the ladies there that got me. The movie had some good moments but a lot of weak ones. Watch this for a good laugh. It's a fantastic midnight movie choice. Another meme-tastic midnight movie is 2001 Shrek. This Oscar winning film combines elements of Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beats, and Rapunzel and creates an imaginative tale with it. I'm sure you're familiar with the plot so I'll head straight to my opinion. Eddie Murphy knocked it out of the park as Donkey. This movie was already laced with a grappling sense of humor, but Eddie took those lines and delivered them like his rent was overdue. I love that they had Fiona transform rather than Shrek, it felt close to home for some reason. Aside from that, this movie was hilarious and I'm afraid I can't analyze it much longer. It's definitely a classic that you need to watch. On the topic of classics, we've got 1937 Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs up next. If you've seen my October movie roundup, you know that I've been on a quest to finish all 75 of the Walt Disney Silly Symphonies that were aired between 1929 to the late 1930s. Yes, this is relevant to the movie, I promise. The animation in Snow White reminded me of what I've been seeing in the newer Silly Symphonies, which makes a lot of sense because this came out at the time they were being distributed. Onto the movie itself, regardless of animation, it was stunning. The songs were beautiful. And Adriana Casalotti, who played Snow White, had the voice of an angel. I understand why people love this movie. On the topic of angelic voices, we've got Doris Day's 1949 musical spectacular, My Dream is Yours. In this marvelous, marvelous movie, Day gets scouted by a record label just by singing over the radio. This movie documents her character's journey from newfound fame to nationwide success and the struggles that come with it. I thought this movie had some good storylines like spoilers ahead, but Day is a single mother in this movie and she has to care for her son while she's touring and I think they demonstrated her relationship with her toddler son very well here. 
There's also a dream sequence where Doris Day and Lee Bowman dressed up as Bugs Bunnies and hopped around. I enjoy those silly moments in older movies. As a fan of Doris Day's, I would recommend this movie, but it's not a movie that you have to see. A movie I'd like you to at least try seeing is 1966's The Shooting. My first impression of this wasn't good, mainly because I didn't understand what was going on. However, after a few days of thinking of this movie a lot, I came to the realization that it's most definitely worth your time. I tell you the plot like I've been doing, but this is a movie you've got to go into blindly. I'll just tell you what or rather who changed my mind about this western. The antagonist's motive aren't really clear, which is what sent me in sort of a spiral. After some thought, I realized they were supposed to be unclear and unsettling because this is an existential movie. Probably my mistake for not noticing that. Watch this during the day or on a road trip. The next musical has a lot of western charm to it presenting 2005's Walk the Line. If you didn't guess by the title, this is a Johnny Cash biopic that, depe that depicts his rise to fame, his turbulent past, and how he heals from all of it. I thought this movie was beautiful. Walk the Line actually got me into Johnny Cash's music and inspired me to explore other artists with the same style as his. Joaquin Phoenix has the range of a chameleon. Seriously. Every time I see him in something, he always nails it. I don't know how- I didn't know he could sing, so that's something new. Reese Witherspoon also was fantastic as June Carter. She portrayed her in such a caring way, at some points you couldn't even tell she was acting, especially during the deeper parts of the movie, which I'll get to soon. Yeah, Reese Witherspoon's performance was definitely my favorite one. Now on to the deeper topics that were talked about in this movie. Obviously, Johnny Cash had a tough history with substances, and that was a storyline in the movie, one that I believe was portrayed well. The way he kept on going back to them was really depressing to see because with how much, un how much stress he was under as an artist, as a father, he was trying to keep it all under control, and those substances were unfortunately the way he coped. There was a scene after Thanksgiving where June took care of Johnny after he had this breakdown at dinner. That scene sold me. This movie is very inspiring but also very heavy because of what's discussed in it. In terms of think in terms of what I think you should end up doing, I think you should watch it. It's an important movie. Sabotage by Alfred Hitchcock is a cold, cold movie. No, it's not set in Antarctica. The movie itself is vile. It's, it's basically about this family who owns a cinema somewhere and they're having trouble getting income in. So the dad does shady underground stuff to pay the bills. When he's not available to deliver this bad machine one day, he sends his son to do so and things just don't go well. Um, and you won't expect how. Expect your, do expect your jaw to drop by the end. Mine definitely did. Early Hitchcock was a whole different man. I would like to mention there was a silly symphony in this movie who unlived Cook Robin was shown in one of the scenes and that symphony really plays into the movie so give it a watch but be prepared for a twisted, sick ending. You thought we were done talking about early Hitchcock? Well think again. The Man Who Knew Too Much was definitely more a thriller than a horror movie in my opinion. There's a kidnapping case, there's this beautiful, intense scene in an auditorium that really captured my attention. If this were my definition of horror, I would have been scared, and I wasn't. I was impatiently waiting to see what happens next, because this movie has so many twists and turns. By the way, this movie in question came out in 1934. There's a remake also directed by Hitchcock, but starring Doris Day that came out in 1956. And I haven't watched that one yet, so watch this as a midnight movie. It'll give you some 12 a.m. chills. Oh my god, we were just talking about Doris Day and now we have another movie of hers to review. The Glass Bottom Boat. It's this late 60s Technicolor spectacle, which is her campiest movie by far. She plays a NASA employee who is wrongfully accused of being a Russian spy. The movie plays with futuristic things like smart homes and current things like rockets, while keeping it lighthearted and funny. Day also sings a, a version of Que Sera Sera in a scene, and it's not a Doris Day movie if there isn't a song. Please, please watch this, you'll have so much fun. I honestly think I just hit the jackpot this time with all of these movies because this next one is so spooky, so girl bossy, and hauntingly fun overall. 
Blythe Spirit is this 1945 film which centers around this author who's looking for new material for his book, so he invites the psychic over for dinner. His wife's all like, this is a bad idea, she keeps me out, and he's like, I don't care. Anyways, she comes over for dinner and somehow revives the ghost of his ex, who his wife cannot see. Then things get messy. That's all I'm going to say about the plot. The movie itself was lovely. I was rooting for this man's unalived ex this whole time. She didn't want to be there, so she's getting her way. The only way you can watch this movie, in my opinion, is if you is if you pair it with 1942's I Married a Witch. Perfect double feature, if you ask me. Stay tuned for a future episode where I will be talking about I Married a Witch because it is higher on my ranking. So, yeah, on to the next movie. Before Mickey Mouse, A History of American Animation is a compilation of all the cartoon characters that were created before Mickey Mouse. Before watching this, I didn't really have any knowledge on cartoon characters that were created in the early 1900s or late 1800s, so watching this awakened me in some way. Just to specify, this movie does center around American animation. I had a nice discussion with someone in my TikTok comments around the time when I first watched this about how animation itself originated in hieroglyphics from a long, long time ago, and I don't want to appear uneducated in any form, so this is American animation. Animation that originated somewhere in the United States. I did enjoy that discussion, I learned a lot, just letting you know before you come at me in the comments of this video. Anyways, I loved seeing Out of the Inkwell, I'm absolutely obsessed with how those were made. If I could watch those cartoons for the rest of my life, I would. There's just something so satisfying about them. I also love the Gertie the Dinosaur ones in the story of the animated drawing, which I'm touching on later. There's actually a demonstration of how the cartoon was supposed to be played, and after watching that, I appreciate it more. Definitely watch this if you want to get into cartoons or animation in general. If you couldn't tell by now, I love that stuff. I also love futuristic dystopian films, and THX 1138 is one of those. George Lucas's directorial debut is a smash hit, in my opinion. It's this freakish sci-fi movie that represents what would happen if we all just took an extremely chill pill and depended on AI to run our world. People running robots, being somewhat sedated, not being able to reproduce in any way, shape, or form, no sign of sunlight, everything around you is technology. Everyone looks the same. It's a slow burn that'll make you question why you're watching it till the very end, but it's so worth it. THX 1138 is this massive question mark that eventually turns into an explanation mark and then a period as the main character develops and reaches the end of his arc. If you're into these kinds of films, watch it. If you're not, still watch it. I honestly dream of living the life Audrey Hepburn lives in Sabrina. She starts as this driver's daughter, which she always starts as some sort of a pitiful character, but like always, she blossoms into this rose after she takes classes at a culinary school in Paris, where she learns about Parisian courses and dresses much nicer because everyone knows a true glow up is wearing clothes you'd find on the streets of Paris. She comes back and suddenly she's thrown into this love triangle between two brothers. She wants this player while the older brother who wants to settle down wants her. Guess who she ends up with? Or just watch the movie to find out. I thought it was magical. Audrey Hepburn always graced whatever screen she was on. She sang La Vie en Rose in a cappella form. I could never. Bonus points for that. I love Audrey Hepburn and her movies. That's all I'm going to say. Now, now. I wish they give an emotional impact warning before this next movie because I was thinking about it for days and days after I finished watching it. 2005's Corpse Bride was undeniably one of the not saddest movies I've watched, but a movie that left me feeling pitiful and angry, which I'm sure that's what Tim Burton wanted. I know the situation in the movie was purely a misunderstanding, but the fact that Emily, the female protagonist, didn't understand that and actually thought she was getting married ruined me. Victor, the male protagonist, said one of the most soul-crushing things I've heard in a while, which is why I left this movie so angry and sad. It's a beautiful Halloween movie, Tim Burton is the king of Halloween, I just don't know how he writes the most depressing things, I guess it's just the false spirit within him. I don't know, it's a classic. Watch Corpse Bride with yourself, not with a partner. 
presenting the long-awaited commentary on the story of the animated drawing. This is the movie that featured the presentation of Gertie the Dinosaur. If you googled this while I was talking about American animation, then you might have seen this as a Disney movie. If you didn't google this, here I am telling you, this is a Disney movie. Walt himself narrated this feature, or doc, about the evolution of animation. He mentioned hieroglyphics and he showed how they were supposed to look in action. He also gave viewers insight as to how one of the first projectors, which was made in France, worked. Then came Gertie, and soon after that he showed us how each slide of Fantasia was crafted and the doc ended with a sequence from Fantasia. I love this because of how diverse this was when it came to technology, meaning it started with the hieroglyphics, then it went to the Fenachistoscope, and then the French projector, and then to Gertie, all the way to Fantasia. It was a process and I loved watching it for that. That was my other little rant about animation focused documentaries for you. Next up, we've got another animated movie, though I promise I won't go as crazy. I know I declared Tim Burton the king of Halloween, but I've got to give it to Jack Skellington this time. The Nightmare Before Christmas was such an amazing watch, the poor guy just wanted some serotonin, so he went to the right place to get some, but did the wrong thing with it. It's okay, bud, we've all been there. What I really liked about this movie, though, is the use of stop motion. If I'm being completely honest, if it were filmed in 2D animation or 3D even, it wouldn't have been as good. The stop motion makes it 10 times creepier because it feels as if these characters are about to lunge at you like some Five Nights at Freddy's animatronics, but it does that by staying somewhat kid-friendly. The songs are awesome. I was playing This Is Halloween on repeat on Halloween. I still can't believe this year was my first time watching it. What the hell? Can you believe that? Hop on whatever streaming service you have next Halloween and watch this because you're missing out, friends. Last but not least, we've got two more Hunger Games installments to go through, so I'm going to make it quick and start with Mockingjay Part 2. Mockingjay Part 2 was a good ending to the series. We see Katniss fight her biggest battle yet, going against the Capitol. Not even sure she's going to make it. Jennifer Lawrence was honestly perfectly cast as Katniss Everdeen. She makes this movie so, so much better and emotional too. To be honest, I only had a little problem with this and that was the last line. It was just cringy. She is there talking to her child who's just had a nightmare and she says, There are worst games to play. I get that. She went through hell in the games, but why end with that line? Just my thoughts as a writer. Aside from that, it was sort of hard for me to get through the movie because of how intense it was. I was scared for most of it, and I love being scared when I'm watching movies. That just shows me that the director did a good job, and this movie was fantastic. So watch this series in order, and please then tell me your thoughts on this final entry. Now for actual final entry of this episode, or number 41 in this list, we have The Hunger Games. Katniss and Peeta's relationship was always there. I don't know why people put Gale into the equation. He disliked Katniss, and Katniss was confused. She felt bad for Gale because he was protecting her family during the games. Peeta was actually protecting Katniss more than Gale ever did, and Katniss was looking out for herself much more than the boys ever looked out for her. That girl and her arrow were unbeatable. As for how the games themselves were made, they were very survival or should I say traditional compared to catching fires. The fright was there, the careers were the real threat before President Snow, but there was nothing visually threatening about these games. Nevertheless, I loved it and I hope you love this video if you've reached this point. Be sure to watch these movies that I've been ranking and also recommending and tune in next week for the third and penultimate episode of this series. See you. Mwah.